Hello, my name's Jean Seaton and I'm the director of the Orwell Prize and we're extremely grateful to the Cheltenham Festival and indeed to our panellists um, for inviting us here today. The Orwell Prize gives a prize each year for the best political writing, best political book, best political journalism and best political blog. But we also try and stimulate arguments and debates around things that Orwell would have been interested in. And um, and he remains an enduringly useful source of thinking. And um, this morning's debate, which we're very excited to be to have such a great panel uh, to perform, um, is exactly at, on a key Orwellian set of topics, which is poverty <coughs> and class and what, you know thinking about these things in the modern context. So thank you very much for coming and thank our panel and thank the Chapman Festival. Let me, add, uh, let me add my very warm welcome to the Times Chapman Literature Festival and in particular for this event. My name is Julia Wheeler and I'm delighted to be chairing the Victorian Values discussion this morning. Our thanks to the Orwell Prize for their sponsorship support. The terms deserving and undeserving poor date back to at least Elizabethan times and specifically the poor law of 1601. They differentiate between people considered to be poor through no fault of their own and for this reason should receive money from their parish and the poor who exhibit negative characteristics, most prominent the idleness, and therefore should not receive any help from public funds. The poor law was overhauled in 1834, and during Victoria's reign there was plenty of debate, of course, about whether people were deserving or otherwise. The debate about poverty has never really gone away, but we're, are we returning to making the distinction between poor people who are deserving and those who are undeserving? Is it right to make that distinction, and what does it say about our society? To discuss these issues, I'm joined by the Guardian investigative journalist and co-author of Jilted Britain, How Britain Has Bankrupted Its Youth, Shiv Malik. Owen Jones has written Chavs, The Demonization of the Working Class. He describes himself as a lefty currently based in Hackney who grew up in Sheffield and is a former flunky for unions and Labour MPs. <laughs> J.C. Harris is Emeritus Professor of Modern History at St. Catherine's College, Oxford. Her main interests are in intellectual history, political thought, and the history of social and economic policy. She wrote a biography of William Beveridge, the inventor of the welfare state, and her most recent book is Civil Society in British History. Ladies and gentlemen, a warm welcome for your Victorian Values panel. Josie, if I may begin with you to, to give us some historical context. These terms deserving and, and undeserving poor, when did the ideas gain credence and how have they changed over the years? Well, I have to say I think that these concepts have been, were, were, were grossly distorted by early 20th century historians who wrote about them because um, I think there's no doubt that many Victorians were concerned with deservingness, just as you know, people are nowadays. But I think it's a complete misconception that the poor law itself actually legally differentiated between them. In fact, um, if the law was strictly observed, it was, it was an illegal act to refuse relief to a poor person, however undeserving. And there are, in fact, quite a number of Victorian legal cases where officials of the poor law or indeed even guardians, who were the kind of local dignitaries who sort of supervised the poor law on a voluntary basis. Um, there, there are a number of cases where people were actually prosecuted and sent to prison for, um, for refusing relief to poor people on the grounds that they were in some way undeserving. So I do think it's very important to distinguish between um, what was legally an official policy and, you know, how folks in the street thought about the poor. And it's the folks in the street, I think, who make these severe distinctions between, you know, who's deserving and who isn't. And does, where, that, does that make sense? It does. Where do these misconceptions come from? Well, it's partly because the idea of deservingness is very prevalent at in certain sectors of Victorian society, and more so, I think, in some periods than in others. Um, but um, again, there are many conceptions in our own society that are constantly discussed, and people 
looking at us from outside might think that as a society we had certain attitudes which we don't necessarily have because certain vocal people <coughs> express those ideas doesn't mean to say that we all hold them. And I think that's exactly the case in the Victorian era. It's a very complex, diverse, long-lasting, multicultural era in which uh, it's only too easy to generalize about what the Victorians thought. Um, we think of it, as you say, as, as a bit Victorian values. Did these ideas go away and then come back, or have they been a, a thread that's followed through since that time? Well, in my view, they, they change and adapt and modify and ebb and flow, um, but the, the, they're still there, of course, yes. Um, right know, through Edwardian it, it, times and... Human beings always make value judgments and uh, will always do so, and always have done in my view. And, uh, and so I don't think one should be surprised that one gets um, moral judgments being passed about other people. Um, but I suppose there are periods, I mean, when, when you get periods of very full employment, for example, then I think people are less concerned about the undeserving um, than they are in periods of mass unemployment, when there's always the fear that there are sort of easy riders or free riders on, on the welfare system. So, um, I, I mean, the high Victorian period is probably very much more liberal and progressive because it had full employment um, and more money to spend on welfare, um, whereas in times of depression, funds are scarce, and this sort of fear of the, the, of the free riders is always there. But um, I, I, I simply don't think one can generalize about Victorian attitudes over such a long period of time. Um, I mean, we were talking earlier about this. The Victorian period lasts as long as the period from the Second World War to now. And I don't need to say how attitudes have ebbed and flowed and changed and transmogrified over the past uh, 60 years. So, oh, and Let me come to you. How fair are these terms deserving and undeserving, Paul? Well, it's interesting, isn't it, actually, after the riots, because people don't talk about the undeserving poor. There's a, another phrase has entered into the mainstream vocabulary, the feral underclass. <laughs> and it's this idea of a poor which isn't just undeserving, it's actually a bit like animals. And in the aftermath of those riots, there was a huge backlash. Understandably, people were angry and, and scared at what had happened. But there was a link made between people on benefits, generally, and the rioters. So David Cameron came out and said, the welfare state needs to be reformed because it's encouraging idleness. He'd said that before the riots, though. No, but afterwards, that was one of his responses to the actual, uh, to the riots itself. And proposals backed by David Cameron were then unveiled to boot rioters and their families from their council homes. That's not just collective punishment um, in the sense that it kicks out people who obviously didn't take part in the rioting, but it's making that link again between, well, people who live in council housing and rioters. What I think is interesting about, for example, benefit fraud, I mean, when we talk about the undeserving poor today, I think benefit cheats is what generally springs to people's minds. And you can not, not only benefit cheats, though, but people who, um, as in Cameron's words, choose it as, as a lifestyle option. As a option. lifestyle option, but this stereotype, if you like, you can mobilise pretty much everyone um, against benefit cheats, and I'll, I'll explain. I mean, you can come up with, you know, someone like me on the left can come up with arguments like, you know, £1.2 billion pounds a year is lost through benefit fraud, according to the government, compared to £70 billion pounds less, uh, lost through tax evasion, for example. Um, all the facts, I mean, the unemployment figures came out last week, Give you an example, whole 14,000 people out of work, only 900 vacancies. But you can mobilise, for example, middle class people against benefit cheats by saying that you, the, these people are wasting your taxes. You can mobilise people who are poor and in scraping by in life, in really bad, uh, in jobs they don't enjoy on the minimum wage, because there's a, a more resentment there than often other groups of people, because there's a sense of these people down the road aren't working at all they have a higher standard of living than you. I mean, factually, that may not be the case at all. Uh, and that provokes anger. But even amongst people on benefits themselves, you can mobilize people. Because there's a sense of, um, especially because people on benefits are so demonized, a sense of distancing. I don't want anything to do with those other people. I, I want to find work, those people don't. So this is a resentment you can tap into. And right-wing journalists and politicians exploit that 
ruthlessly. Are they wrong to do so? Yeah, well, um, absolutely, in the sense that what well, benefit fraud, for example, is, is complex. It does exist. It's massively exaggerated. It constitutes, according to the government figures, less than 1% of welfare spending. There's a bigger problem of benefits evasion. £16 billion pounds worth of benefits aren't claimed, which for people are eligible for, for example. Um, the Joseph Rowntree Foundation did a study into actual, what we would call benefit fraud, and they found it was very complicated. It was often people on benefits uh, doing uh, a couple of hours of cash in hand work to pay off particular debts, for example. It wasn't people consciously milking the system. But what we have had in Britain, because of deindustrialization in the 1980s, is entire communities were stripped of secure work. People call this the hourglass economy. And, for example, I went to Ashington. It used to be the biggest pit village in the world. Those jobs disappeared and they weren't replaced properly. There was fewer jobs, they were more insecure. So lots of people, you do have this, in particular, vicious circle of people moving in and out of work. This idea of a static group of people and benefits is hugely exaggerated. But what's changed since Thatcherism, I think, and this is the crucial change, is we stopped looking at things like poverty and unemployment as social problems. They became seen as individual failings. So just, just quickly, I've got a quote from Thatcher. It was a little reported interview she did in the late 70s. She said, nowadays there really is no primary poverty left in this country. In Western countries, we are left with the problems which aren't poverty. All right, there may be poverty because they don't know how to budget, don't know how to spend their earnings, but now you are left with a really hard, fundamental character personality defect. Now, that's Thatcher at her most strident, but that sums up, in a sense, the core of Thatcher's uh, Thatcher I art philosophy towards what would have been called social problems. They're individual failings, and if you believe that, then why have a welfare state at all? Because, of course, the welfare state is simply subsidising people's, it's propping up individual failings. What has to change is their personal behaviour. Shiv Malik, why have a welfare state at all? <coughs> hmm. um, well, we, we, we have one for very good humanitarian reasons, basically, otherwise we would end up with a lot of people starving, and we really would. Um, but I think the whole issue has come back again, as to pick up on the point made earlier, that you know when resources are scarce, um, and when these two basic fundamentals of life, housing and, and jobs, are scarce, um, uh, i.e. there's high unemployment and actually getting a house is either very expensive and this means you know whether you're renting or socially uh, you know you're moving house socially when, when these things become scarce then, then people do um, you know you end up in a situation where society itself just turns in on itself essentially uh, but then I move away from the notion of and this is where I sort of disagree with Owen and his book is absolutely fascinating and absolutely amazing um, but this is where you know, uh, the, the, the tension arises. Uh, the title of the book, by the way, is Jilted Generation, not <coughs> Jilted Britain, because uh, that would be a, a, perhaps an easier sell. I uh, would say everyone's Sorry, jilted. Yeah, no, it's okay. Um, but uh, <laughs> it's generations that they come from. And I think where um, we, it's usually tied to the notion of the working class, and this is where I think the problem uh, arises. What is the working class today in modern Britain? Uh, you've given some very good definitions in your book, but I just don't think they stick. Uh, and where I tend to settle on is that we we, have, we live we basically we're living through an era in which it's it's generations which will decide what is happening. We're living obviously uh, longer than ever, and that's a great thing. Um, but there you can already see problems arising. Um, and what young people in Britain are facing today, as a group, as a group holistically, is they are unable to get the kind of education and skills that they need without paying vast resources for it. They're politically unrepresented, uh, and um, you, they're also finding it incredibly difficult to get those, as I said, two basic things, which is housing and work. Uh, and they're the group that are kind of, in a sense, coming together. And you see this around the world. In the last year and a half, two years, you've seen ostensibly young people protesting in the Middle East, in Greece, in, uh, uh, in Spain, the Indignados movement, and now also, uh, to a sense, in, in the US. Uh, and they're not seeing themselves as sort of a class movement. That comes back, in a sense, to the fact that we do actually live in a post-Thatcherite era in which we do see ourselves as individuals. Uh, um, much more, far much more than you know, we did, have, sort of almost, I would say, in human history. People have realized themselves in many ways. 
Uh, and that's a very difficult thing for the left to get to grips with. But how can we talk about one generation as a homogenous group? I mean, there's a, a huge difference between a young man, for example, in Ashington, his former pit village, who mm. simply can't get work, he might maybe left school at the age of 16 and is a long-term unemployment, and um, the son of a millionaire in London who can sail into unpaid internships, which he can afford to live on for two yep. years, get, get a rung on the ladder, which obviously a working class lad could never dream of doing because you can't, you can't get, you know, you can't live on an unpaid internship. So the class differences in the generation you're describing are massive, and so that's the problem. How do we put that yeah, generation? It's very together? easy to lump them together. They're both dependent. Um, the rich guy is dependent on his parents, and the, the poor person will, uh, in some way, be dependent upon the state. So they're both dependent. Neither of them can live, ironically now, independently. Uh, through their own means, through their own hard work, can they seem to achieve the things that are quite basic? But uh, a young man know. working for Goldman Sachs, he's living independently. Um, yeah. There, I, I the there is one thing about the society we live in now which is historically unprecedented, and that is that statistically the working class, including the affluent, prosperous working class, of whom there's still quite a large contingent, but they are nevertheless a minority of society, which they've never been before in British society or sort of Western European society. And it's something a bit different from the United States where, I mean, anyone who has a job in the USA, as far as I can make out, is middle class. If you're, if you're a person who sort of cleans the floor in university halls of residence. If you've got a regular job in the States, you're middle class. And that's not what I mean. I mean that jobs which we traditionally think of as working class are now, that the people who hold them are a minority in British society, which they, 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 they were not in. I, I, the, the significant change comes sometime between the 1960s and the 1980s. Um, and when the, the, the working class stopped being the largest group, and I, I think that is very, very significant for all kinds of values. Well, something that you bring out in your book is that the middle class has either got aspirate, the working class has either got aspirational and, and gone to middle class, or it's become this feral underclass. No, well, I challenge that idea. She would obviously clarify uh, because I would argue. That no, no, I, I'm not saying that all these people are a feral underclass. No, 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 no,
generally speaking. That's an asset. Yeah, that's Something they can true of make large numbers. Right, exactly. So that's where now that's where you come to a point where you realise actually that is true of a lot of people. Even if they are working class, they might well own their own home. Home ownership in this country stands at about 68%. And then that strict economic definition becomes a little difficult. Where you end up back in the sort of kind of strict economic working class definition is with young people again. They don't tend to own their own homes, and many of them rent. So you're back to kind of a, where, where they're, you know, you've got a rentier air class, which tends to be the older generation, because they're the ones, strictly speaking, who are their landlords. Um, you know, the average age of a landlord is about 50 or so. Um, I think it's a little bit older. Um, uh, but they're living off the work of younger people. Now, this seems very uncomfortable, but it's not actually ever been this way. Well, it hasn't been this way for many years, uh, for at least 30 or 40 years. Uh, you know, and the average age of buying a house, for example, is a lot harder. And then the underlying aspect of that is security, right? So this is where people start to feel like they're either part of the working class or the middle class. If people feel secure, and what do we mean by that? Simply that, not just that they won't get burgled or mugged, that's a physical security, but the economic security of this, i.e. knowing that your job is going to last, knowing that you won't be thrown out by your landlord with a month's notice because they might want to sell up, right? These, are, and, and then, being able, therefore, to raise a family and have some stability in that respect. That's what makes you, I think, working class in that sense, in your mentality, or not. There are all sorts of other cultural definitions and all sorts of other cultural aspects which then play and, and have tension with that. But the security aspect is absolutely central. And that's, again, why I think young people are in a precarious situation. They are in a precarious situation. And when I mean young people, I mean under 30s. A third of them are living with their parents still. Uh, because they can't be independent. Literally, they can't afford to do it. Um, and, and that's why I think they're in a group that might be solidified uh, in, in that fashion, in that sort of, if you want, working class fashion. Josie, that is something that's changed. Yeah, in it's, it's, generation. It's, it's very interesting the way societies <coughs> slice themselves up into opposing groups. And uh, I suppose we're, I mean, working class and middle class are such powerful concepts, and they have. Yeah this enormous um, tradition of sort of Marxian and non-Marxian sociological theory behind them. Um, but uh, no, I, I mean, I, I'm certainly not arguing that there are no causes of tension and conflict and irreducible <coughs> conflicts of interest. I'm just suggesting that the, the sort of, the, the, the old kind of um, stereotypes of class have completely vanished. <coughs> and that people who, in any earlier generation would have been regarded as working class, are now not a majority, which they've been for, you know, infinite generations in past history. But that's and partly, that, isn't it? I mean, I think part of the problem there is people have a cultural conception of class, don't they? I mean, people have this notion. Well, people have different notions of Well, of course, class. everyone's got a different, yes. you know, lots of people have a different... Anyway, we forget, because... They're not because, saying, well, yes. band, yes. they're not working Exactly, class. exactly, yeah. you know, they're not sooty face, they're not, you know, <laughs> do you listen, do you watch X Factor these days, or do you listen to Radio 4? That's often how people understand class, but I, I mean, my argument is, is, is an show economic... Sure, sure. Show of Look at you all. Um, Radio 4. <laughs> it's Radio 4, then my argument what falls instantly because the overwhelming majority of those who listen to radio listen to Radio 4. But I mean, you can be a postal worker and listen to Radio 4, and I can still argue you're working class, and you can be an aristocrat and watch X Factor, and you're still an aristocrat. But it's interesting, I know that sounds almost ridiculous, but that is, people have that cultural sense of class, it's almost your tastes. And um, as, uh, there was a study this year about by Britain Thinks, which looked at attitudes to class. And when people who are self-defined as middle class asked to sum that up, they came back with a cafetiere. Um, <laughs> okay, hands up for cafetiers. <laughs> and while we're on the subject of popular culture, interesting in, in your book that the, um, the perceptions and the portrayals of working class people, um, the Waynes and Waynettas, for example. Or, well, I think the striking example people like normally people comes to mind is Vicky Pollard. Mm -hmm. And you know, a lot of my friends laughed at that. Actually, I didn't think Little Britain was technically funny, uh, how offensive it was aside, but Vicky Pollard is uh, the creation, you know, it's, as I say, if you laugh at it, it's fair enough, but it's the creation of a privately educated millionaire male comedian who's dressing up as this caricature of a feckless, um, thick um, teenager from a, teenage mum from a white working class background is so stupid she swaps one of her kids for Westlife CD. Um, 
<laughs> but a poll was done, and this is what's disturbing, a poll was done uh, for the Edinburgh Festival by YouGov, and uh, over 70% of people who worked in TV, and it was a survey to people who work in TV, thought she was an accurate representation of the white working class. <laughs> but what's, uh, what's interesting about these portrayals is they do have an impact. They're firstly, I think, a reflection of attitudes, but they help to reinforce those attitudes too. Because you get things like Vicky Pollard, you don't get any other, you know, there's a lack of positive representations of working class single mothers <coughs> on TV, even though, you know, only one in 50 single parents are teenagers, over 60% are actually in work. You don't see that reality there. You get this idea of the slobbish, feckless mummy just has a teenager to get a council flat. That's what comes to people's minds. Same with Shane. But you see, I'd say that that hasn't changed since the 60s, does but, it? Uh, but I think what's changed is you did have positive representations on TV of working class people, certainly. You've got the reality, you have the likely lads, the good life, the rag trade about female trade unions. Yeah. But the good life was taking the mick out of middle class. Exactly, yeah. they were on the receiving end of yeah. jokes, and that's what's changed. Yes. I wonder whether, I, I, I'm one of you, I can't remember what it is now, mentions this notion of social mobility as something which is potentially a bit pathological. Because it, it, I, I mean, it seems to me, it's when, when you have the leader of the Labour Party saying that the sort of primary objective of the Labour Party is, is to have maximum social mobility, and without thinking at all about the people who are not socially mobile, that there's something very odd about this. But if you go back to, say, half a century ago, um, then um, there were very large numbers of people in British politics who were not only of working class backgrounds, but actually still continue to identify themselves as working class, who are extremely clever. Uh, I mean, not just intellectually clever, but brilliant at organization. And You know, you, you all know the sort of people I'm talking about. I mean, I suppose um, <coughs> Ernest Bevan is a kind of classic example of someone who was not merely working class, but really lower working class, of a very, from a very underprivileged background, who was a fantastic organizer, a man of tremendous sort of moral integrity and power, who rose to the top of British politics. And now, of course, Ernest Bowen would have got lots of A-levels, gone to university, and he would be um, a, a working class representative of a totally different kind. And I, well, I put this to both of you, as uh, how, how far is this a problem for the public representation of working class interests now? Well, well I think what's changed, and so, I mean, if we think of the post-war Labour government, yeah. it's really interesting, because three of the pillars of them, Clement Attlee, of course, who was partly yeah. educated, was Ernie Bevan, Knight Bevan, and uh, Herbert Morrison, exactly. and they were all exactly. working class yes, that's people. The point I they, and it's interesting, they were working class in the sense their career was working class, mm. and jobs, mm. that, I mean, until their late 20s, and the, the avenues that were available to rise to the top of politics were the trade union movement mm -hmm. and local government. That's how they both rose to the top. Mm -hmm. I'd argue those avenues have been shut down. Today we won't have miners at the top of politics, well, there's no miners, but no supermarket works. It's not that they've been shut down, mm -hmm. it's that we have this thing called upward social mobility, which means that it's not that they're shut down, it's that they're not there anymore because they've become upwardly mobile. We have a concept, but we don't actually have it, and it's failing more uh, now than ever before. Uh, so people well, are it may actually have been stopped now, but yeah. over the past 40 years, it has certainly not stopped. No, it's, it's been, been slowly very... grinding to a halt. And, and, and what we've set up now, I'm going back to the young people, but this is kind of an interesting because it's a predictor of what's going to happen. Right? Um, what we've set up now is a situation where young people are not now going to be able to go to university and they think because they're going to have to fork out all, these, all this money for university. They, they are able to do very simple things like, you know, just, uh, I mean, maybe this is not so simple, but buying a car, the concept of buying a car, or that kind of mobility that would have seen, been seen as entering the middle classes, young people can't do that anymore. They don't have any savings. <coughs> uh, so we're going to end up, I mean, that's a predicament. We're going to actually go back to a class system I'm, I'm in this country. I'm suggesting something slightly different. And that is not what is going to happen from now. It's what's been happening over the past several decades. Yes. Which is that um, almost by definition, if you're clever and aspiring, you stopped being working class. Whereas I think that was not so earlier in the century. No, it's a point that Owen makes in the book brilliantly. 
uh, and, uh, and, and the way in which we have been seen to say, well, I, I, I think it comes down to this. Basically, there was a point at which you know, we're working class and we're going to improve the lot of not just myself, but people around me. Uh, and then we move from that. My class well, yeah, exactly. And then we move from that uh, in the last 30 to 40 years to saying, well, look, I'm going to improve my own situation. Uh, and we live in a sort of much more individual and rise out of my own situation um, in, in whatever way that's, that, that happens, um, leaving aside group interest. But the question comes is again, well, what do we want at the heart of this, right? What do we want? I mean, we don't surely want people to become more working class in a sense, do we? I mean, what do we mean by that? And, and I think it's going to happen anyway. Uh, I mean, do we want people's living standards to rise? I'll do. What's the base value of this? Do we want people to have more security? Do we want people to be I, richer? I mean, what I do we think want? It's a very good thing for people to be educated, secure, and have jobs, and <coughs> also to participate in public affairs. Um, but the problem I have with social mobility, I suppose, is it's about accepting inequality but building ladders between two unequal <coughs> groups, effectively. And the problem I have with it is it only benefits a small group of people. You cream off the most able and parachute them into the middle class without answering what happens with everyone else. And that can actually encourage demonization because it's the <coughs> idea that those who are able made it to the top, and if you weren't able, then you deserve to be where you are. I, I, I certainly think the fact that there are far fewer working class people does encourage the idea that they are intrinsically different from, and that's why I find <coughs> social mobility as a sort of be-all and end-all of public life, which I think it is in danger of becoming. I do find that a rather dangerous concept. Don't worry, as I said, it's grinding to a halt. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm a little dubious about whether that's anything more than a temporary blip. And I think one should face the possibility that social mobility in itself may create pathological effects in society, even without a recession and, um, and all these sort of economic disincentives to going to university. What, in a way, you can't deny is that if we don't have a, we can argue and discuss about the working class, we can't deny is that there is a massive uh, well, a very small group of people who are massively rich. Uh, and that is something that has changed uh, and exacerbated, in a sense, over the last 20 years. And, and that's often not where the debate is. Um, and we certainly have only just begun, perhaps, to beat up on them. Yeah, and it's, it's, in, it's interesting because I think an economic crisis like the one we're obviously in does focus attention on unjust distributions of wealth and power in society. Yeah. Giving exactly, you know, in the last year, the average Briton has experienced the biggest squeeze in their living standards since the 1920s. But last year, the pay packet of the directors of the top FTSE 100 companies went up by 55%. And what you have there is recession for everyone else, but boom time still for the people at the top, so it's, I think that is focusing, because what's dangerous, I think, in the recession is even as more people are thrown out of their jobs, not through their own fault, the idea that the scrounger became more widespread, more demonised than ever before, mm. the bottom was getting kicked instead of the people who actually <coughs> caused the crisis in the first place. Hasn't there been plenty of demonisation of the bankers? Well the, bank, well, the bankers certainly have got a kicking, but look what we're talking about in terms of rhetorically, they're still getting their hefty <laughs> bonuses and living hugely wealthy and powerful lives, but the people at the bottom are actually being kicked by the government. Mm -hmm. And we're talking about benefit cuts, we're talking, I mean, housing benefit cuts in London will, will literally send tens of thousands of people out of their home. People's living standards are actually declining in the, in the bottom, and they will do so as the cuts hit. That's what's different. I, I, tell you, I, uh, I had a, a bet with uh, uh, Professor Julian Legrand, who um, was, uh, is it, is it, Funny character, anyway, but um, he was part of the. the, the <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, even in a here. Funny in the sense that he's, he's both humorous and, and has had a, uh, an interesting uh, political background. And he's been very much involved, I guess, with the New Labour project in many respects and reforming benefits, those kinds of things, and introducing uh, changes like that. Um, but he, we, we discussed this element about a year ago. It, it, um, about what would happen during the recession and whether the rich would get richer or, as traditionally happens during most ordinary recessions, actually things level out again. Um, so in the 80s and 90s, the rich get less rich and therefore things level out. It's not like the poor get richer during a recession. Um, 
And uh, so we took a bet. I said, actually, with my co-author, we both took a bet. And, uh, and the bet was that he would buy us dinner, uh, or, or we would buy him dinner if we lost. Uh, uh, and uh, and um, uh, according to if the rich got richer or not. So, um, uh, well, you actually did it then. <laughs> yeah, uh, during this recession. And, uh, and our argument was actually we're living through with sort of the, you know, the quantitative easing effects, et cetera, et cetera, the rich would in fact get a hell of a lot richer during the session. I think we won that bet, so I'm going to now call him up after this and, and try and put dinner at the fat duck or something like that. Um, but uh, um, what was interesting is watching, gathering all of these bits of evidence for this, um, and looking at, for example, Forbes and the list of billionaires that have gone up uh, by something like 30% in the world or something like that in the last year and a half, and then going to a pub in Hampstead and finding that there was a little section there um, which was selling handmade luxury dog treats. And I asked the guy, I said, this is the middle of a recession. I said, how are you selling handmade luxury dog treats? And who is making this? It's a very bizarre thing, because clearly it's, a, you know, it's expenditure that most people just couldn't afford. And he said, yeah, they're selling the, the hot cakes out of the door. Um, and, and that gives you an insight into kind of how, I guess, people are in fact getting a lot richer at the top. Um, that have this kind of disposable income. Could I change the focus from anecdotes of injustice to the structure of the world economy? <laughs> I'm trying to relate Please to do. <laughs> the dogs don't think it's injustice, I'm sure. I'm sure the dogs love it. Yeah. But if you go back to, say, comparing us with the Victorians, then it's true that Britain was the kind of central focus of a, a gigantic world empire. But I think most economic historians actually think that um, the empire was, 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 was probably uh, um, financially a dead loss. Um, it, 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 the costs outweighed the benefits. Britain's trading relations were mainly with areas outside the empire. Um, but the fact is, um, whether people were rich or poor, for most people, Rothschilds apart, depended on the state of the British economy. And now that just is not the case. Um, you know, I, I, I'm in no sense defending these ghastly bankers who say, oh, well, we will move to Switzerland or Latin America um, if you kind of tax us more than 40%. Um, but it is nevertheless a fact that the, the, the economy in which we live is global, it's no longer national. And this has enormously powerful um, bearings upon the, the role of the people who are doing all the terrible things that you're, you're talking about. Now, how, how, how can the social critic address that fact? Well, it needs a global movement. I mean, what's interesting about this, you know, people may have seen this Occupy Wall Street idea yeah. today, There'll be similar protests all over the world because you're absolutely right. What you've had is just globalisation of capital, and similarly, you need a globalisation of, of labour and, of course, the poor well, themselves. We do to some extent that because we have migration of people. No, no. So think that coming to doing very jobs is absolutely wonderful compared with what they would be if they were sort of road sweepers in Zanzibar or whatever. Yeah, see, um, the, the heart of this. Of, of Thatcher's idea was actually not the destruction of the working class. That, that was, a, was a, I think, a completely negative way of looking at it, because people really did vote for her. Uh, and she did actually have something incredibly positive to say, which is about individualism. But it was ultimately, at the heart of that, was about freedom. And the very first thing that she did um, was, uh, and, and everyone seems to forget this, was that literally the very first thing that she did in office was to get rid of all capital controls in this country. And people think, you know, oh, Thatcher, great, you know, nationalist, et cetera, et cetera. But she made us, as a, as a, as a nation, less sovereign than ever uh, before, which is a crazy idea if you think about it, because that's never trumpeted about her. The fact that she gave up all of our powers to determine our economic future, uh, essentially, um, it, is, it was a huge thing. I mean, i.e. allowing all you know, money to flow in and out of our country without being, I mean, let me put this to you. People often say, well, look, I mean, it came with benefits, you see. So people say, well, look, I, you know, I remember the time. I, we couldn't go on foreign holidays you know, in the sort of 1960s, 70s. And people think it's because they were poor. Uh, and it wasn't. It was because they couldn't take money out of the country. You have your passport stamped, because you can only take 100 pounds or 250 pounds limit change. 
out of the country to go to wherever, even to France. Mm -hmm. uh, and when that changed, then you ended up with an airline business that was, you know, Ryanair. Uh, and then people could go on these foreign holidays. That was, that was the difference, economically speaking. But without those kinds of controls, you can't do the kinds of things like improve whole, you know, the lives of whole groups of people. You can't use the tools of the state unless you bring back capital controls. And, there, and then people will say, well, hang on, you're taking away my freedom to go on a gap year in Thailand. Or you know, to buy cheap jeans from Primark. Um, I mean, you know, so that's, that's the irreducible sort of tension. One between this desire for security and this other between this desire for freedom. And I think uh, it, that's really where the debate lies. And that's, I mean, that's a tricky one to resolve. And no one's come up with an answer for it, uh, except maybe from Morris Glassman. I think if we have a third world war, it's just possible. Oh, we may revert. <laughs> it's a bit early. Yeah. <laughs> we may revert. We may revert as, as a consequence at the other end of it, if we survive, then uh, we may revert to nation state based economies. But I don't think it's going to happen unless this... But that's why I think it needs a global movement in order to challenge that. I don't mean individuals... I mean, it's almost social mobility writ large when you're talking about that model of immigration. But actually a global movement which challenges globalised capital. But that needs kind of a class consciousness, if you like. And as I say, that's but, but what... But how realistic, how realistic is that? Well, I think we're already seeing the seeds of that. Today, I mean, we're seeing the scenes. Well, of but when you talk about global, you mean Western society, or do you include the Chinese? The, yeah, the absolutely. Indians? Because the problem with globalisation is the race to the bottom inherent in it. Because, because partly living standards, uh, real wages before the crash were falling in Britain uh, from 2004 onwards. So for the bottom third, it went into decline after 2004. For the bottom half, it stagnated. Part of that reason, I think, is weak trade unions. You don't have. Um, unions organising to challenge the, the amount of wealth going to the top, but also the, the hundreds of millions of cheap Indian and uh, Chinese workers enter the global market and companies go, well, we'll just go abroad uh, to India or China. And I think you need a global movement to challenge that race to the bottom. But how do you think the, the experience of the, the Indian working class, if you like, how do you think they perceive the British working class or the European working class well, fairly of, differently. Of course, no, of course there are huge divisions, of course. I mean, I mean, that's what would have to be overcome. I think there are huge divisions between America. And how are we going to do that? How are we going to overcome that? Well, as I say, I think these movements at the moment, I think well, look, we're the beginning of a global economic crisis in many ways. And I think what's interesting is how you do have lots of very disparate movements at the moment all over the world, both in the developed world and in what was known as the third world. And it's, you're right, whether that will link up or not is, remains to be seen. But I do think there's that common interest that the people at the top globally are getting richer, but that's not true for everyone else, necessarily. Just, um, sorry, go. Well, I was going to say, yeah, you can go that way, which is, um, I, you have a kind of global taxation system. That's, that's the beginnings of what you'd end up with, is global governance of sorts. Uh, and that would sort this problem out. Uh, uh, there is another way. Um, Just like that. It, 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 would, it would sort the problem out, ultimately. Uh, but it would require massive transitions in the way uh, people around the world think about themselves and, their, and, their, and, and that's ultimately, and political systems and all of that upheaval. So it's, it's unlikely to happen, let's say. Um, there is another way, which is that you go kind of hyper-local um, and you start to build security in, not with the state sort of intervening, um, but, but through civil society and through legal contract, if you want. It's mutualism, it's the cooperative movement, it's the bit of the Labour Party that we've forgotten for the last 70 years. Uh, and that's why I mentioned Morris Glassman, because I think that's actually what he's trying to do. Uh, it's a kind of John Lewis model. John Lewis will never outsource, because it's owned by the people uh, who work in it, and there's other forms of that, essentially. Um, and because uh, they're, they're unlikely to outsource their own jobs. But it's incredibly profitable. I'm sure everyone here has been to John Lewis at some point, or Waitrose, um, and, and actually quite enjoyed the experience. Uh, and, and their profits go up, actually. Just change tack for a, a second. Jilted generation. When no. I was reading it, I did get this sense that you felt all, all that young I hear a people. No, no, yeah. this is a challenge. Uh, that young people had an entitlement, really, um, and, and no sense that this generation, this post-war generation, and, and afterwards, it, almost as if this had landed in their lap and that they hadn't worked for it and so on, and therefore. That, that mm -hmm. your generation and those younger than you, sh you know, should have a bit of that too. Actually, I think the entitlement goes the other way. It's actually older people who feel incredibly entitled. They feel, I mean, whether that's right or not is, is a different matter. But um, 
I think it's the old generation who feel that there should be a free NHS at the point, uh, without even thinking about how that's going to be paid for, ultimately. And it's certainly not in terms of housing, in terms of... Yeah, that's right. We should have a, a society in which people feel they're entitled to some sort of secure housing, because otherwise we, we literally are living in a third world country where we're like, well, fine, you have no entitlement to housing. If you work for it, you're still not going to get a house. Tough luck, Sonny. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and then we'll just pick up a whole lot of homeless people on the street. I mean, do we really want that country? Given the incredible wealth that we have, building houses is a really simple thing to do. Uh, providing enough housing is a really simple thing to do. Um, it's not difficult. I just flummoxed, flummoxed as to why uh, we live in a society where that's not the case. I mean, I was talking to, uh, I was in Brussels giving a talk a couple of days ago and talking to Germans about this. I'm talking to Italia, a room full of Europeans, surprisingly, in Brussels. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and the Italians were like, yes, this is exactly you know, what's happening. Oh, we have a terrible housing situation, terrible jobs. The Germans just turned around and said, well, look, you know, if you work hard in Germany, you'll get a decent career. You'll have a decent standard of living. You'll never be mega rich, but you'll have a decent standard of living. You'll be able to raise a family in a home where you can stay in. And they rent mainly in Germany. Um, and, but they have rights to these tenancies. And I thought, great, that's a brilliant country. That sounds like a very basic contract. And we used to have that. We gave that up. Crazy idea. Yeah, I agree, but it's interesting, the last generation, though, in terms of this kind of yeah. generational conflict model, but, I mean, in the 1980s, large sections of the last generation suffered enormously. I mean, well, they're Cameron's of, generation, actually. Uh, well, I mean, Cam well, there's a difference between Cameron and a minor. I mean, hundreds yeah. of thousands of... <laughs> but that's the point I'm making, okay? Yeah. So, but whilst people... Are, I mean, this is a class division argument. Yeah. Whilst people at the top mm. and certain sections of the society certainly benefited during Thatcherism, what about the hundreds of thousands of miners, middle-aged miners, who may have benefited from the post-war settlement, who were thrown out of their jobs and no. I, I met Absolutely. and are still languishing in them? Absolutely. I mean, uh, I've done many pieces of the New States when you've got to go up and, and you know, you do those, those pieces and you realise, you know, 20 years later, people are still suffering and it, it's the mental suffering really uh, that that goes on that's the worst element of that uh, when people feel totally depressed uh, by the whole situation even if they know that they could work they just you know you end up with a just total depression of a whole community well, well there's um, just a lack of work and there's a lack of I mean, work uh, yeah I mean, it's just um, and, but, but how does but, that fit into the generation? Well, conflict? because at least I think I mean it's a, again it's a kind of a worse race to the bottom you end up with even less security for young people now. And the government's deliberately taking away those elements of, for example, to, you know, you have the shared room rate when it comes to housing benefit. It's been moved from 25, it's basically giving less money to people because they're younger, which is, by the way, massive age discrimination. We haven't talked about that. Um, so they used to give less, of a, less money to people who are aged uh, under 25 for council housing benefit. Now they just shifted it up to 35. Uh, because if, and actually, and the reason was internally is because they know that young people live with other people anyway. So why not just shove it up to 35 and give them less money while you're at it? Um, which is terrible. Um, uh, I mean, it's just pure age discrimination. Again, we have that with the national minimum wage. Um, so I, I think it's, it's really. Final point. I won't questions. I'm a bit surprised about Germany being held up as a model of sort of intergenerational equality in this way because English universities at the moment are absolutely flooded with very well-educated young Germans who um, increasingly form a very significant minority among sort of younger university professors because they cannot make any progress in German universities because German professors have no retirement age which cannot be transcended. So like the Americans, they are there forever and so Germans are spread all over Europe, but particularly to Britain, where they come with their beautiful English, um, because they have so many more opportunities here. At least they can raise families, and I think that's, that's really important, you know. Let's um, let's open the floor to questions because I, I can see hands going up already. Um, right, this person here, let's start with. We'll come to you next. I can see you. Yeah. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Hi, um, I'll nail my colours to the mask at the outside. I have a copy of Jilted Generation on my Kindle, and I try to force everybody under 30 in my office to read a copy of it. Did um, that work, by the way? And did they buy another copy? They did. <laughs> <laughs> they have to. Oh, excellent. Um, I've been working with pension funds since the 1990s, and I agree that the, the intergenerational conflict, the amount of money that is going into protecting the pensions for a generation of baby boomers are not going into pensions for the younger generation is frightening. Um, all the money does seem to be going into the older generation and in, in terms of how that fits in with the class conflict, I think 
what you're what you're in danger of doing is creating a new aristocracy. Um, as Shiv said, the, the the similarity between the 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 millionaire living with his parents and the young person who can't go to university is that they're both completely dependent. Um, if wealth is going to be passed down through the, the, the parent to child rather than through labor, you risk creating a, a completely new aristocracy and a feudal system. And actually the trade unions have been very complicit in this. The trade unions have been very, very uh, vociferous in protecting the pensions rights of people up to a certain age. They call rubbish. them accrued rights. Absolute rubbish. <laughs> the unions are trying to protect pensions for young people as well. Exactly. And they they're call not winning that battle, exactly. but they're doing it. And they call them accrued exactly. rights. And as Shiv pointed out, this is total age discrimination, um, but it's not looked at. There was actually an exemption in the age discrimination. Yeah. Yeah. There was actually an exemption in the age discrimination regulations. We're going to take it away. Make a question. Um, do you think you're going to create a new aristocracy? Uh, okay. um, I will be short in this and let uh, 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 an answer. I think the question is, um, I guess, in Britain, are we going to create a new aristocracy by this generation? Yeah, I think we are. I really think we are. I, I think on the pension point, ultimately people just want, you know, the pensions are a massive uh, they could be a, 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 a great benefit in terms of intergenerational common effect because that's what, exactly what they are. They're a contract between young and old people. And the, the people who've been twisting that, if you want, are actually the people in the city. They've been creaming off pension benefits. Uh, of pension. The, the returns on pensions ultimately have been about 0% in the last 10 years. But people in the city seem to get very rich. Um, and, uh, and, and it's because it's pension money going into the city. It's all your money, essentially fueling speculation, and has been for the last 10 years, which is really unfortunate for all of us, um, because we could have been putting it into slightly lower returns, but safer, perhaps like housing. Um, uh, but yeah, I think we are in danger of creating a uh, new aristocracy, as I sort of mentioned before. We really are. Well, I mean, mechanism. inherited wealth, obviously, there's nothing new about that. That's, I mean, that's the class system uh, summed up in lots of ways, in the sense of, sorry, inherited, the inherited class system, um, and, you know, when we talk about the class difference of the generation, as I say, there's a difference between someone languishing in, uh, you know, the one in five young people are unemployed. Disproportionately, these are working class people, working class communities. If you're someone who are middle, middle class, well connected, you're very, very unlikely to suffer long term unemployment. Statistically, that's true. The point about the unions, well, I have to support the I'm going to call you a heckler, Ben. You know, heckler. <laughs> <laughs> okay. The whole point about unions is, uh, well, firstly, they're trying to stop us, us young people working far, far longer. And there's a, there's a point about class there because there's a huge class difference in death. Yes, generally speaking, we're all working, uh, we're living longer. But if you live in uh, one area of Glasgow, life expectancy is lower than the West Bank. And it's about 25 years lower than Kensington and Chelsea. So what unions are trying to do, firstly, is avoid this race to the bottom. What the government are trying to do is just divide and rule between the public and the private sector. Because there's been an attack on private sector pensions, coverage has gone from half to a third. And instead of arguing to drag up private sector pensions to the level of public sector pensions, they're talking about dragging public sector pensions down, uh, which is obviously the wrong way of doing it. So unions are trying to make that case for good pension rights for everybody, not least our generation, we're the ones who will end up working longer and longer. And if you're working class or poor, well, the poorer you are, the more that will hit you because the, the sooner you will die. There's a question, the hand went up here. You've got a microphone? Okay, yes please. I agree with you about the importance of housing. And now Ed Miliband is saying that we should award council housing to the people who are working. Who's going to look after those who aren't? It, it, it's, well, frankly, and I speak, I'm a, I'm a member of the Labour Party as a disclaimer, it's an absolute disgrace. At a time of mass unemployment, when people have been thrown out of work through no fault of their own, at a time when, because of the failure of the last government to build social housing, we now have five million people on social housing waiting lists in this country. So to argue that we should discriminate against the unemployed and social housing is outrageous. And it does tap into the prejudice which has been whipped up by the right, by the media, that those who are unemployed are unemployed because it's their own fault, they're feckless, they're idle, they've not been thrown out of work because we've got one of the biggest economic crises of the last century. I mean, it, you know, it comes down to scarce resources, that road, because we don't have enough council housing social housing, which is incredibly cheap and incredibly secure, unlike the private rented sector, which is incredibly expensive, most expensive, uh, and, and very unsecure. Um, 
So uh, people have been scrabbling for it, and the question is, how have we rationed it? Well, we rationed it on the basis of, of essentially humanitarian reasons, right? If you are the uh, least able uh, and, uh, and you have the least assets, uh, et cetera, et cetera, least security, you're not in work, that kind of thing, then we'll give you a council Ooh. house. And, uh, and if you do enough of that over enough time, you end up with estates that uh, then become sink estates by that, by that sort of definition. Um, there's a really great way out of it to build more. Exactly. Um, uh, it's, it's just, you know, it's just common sense. And then you, seem not to apply. then you don't have people being set against each other, which is what that is trying to do. And you don't have to build more counter housing necessarily. You can build more other types of housing as well. Right? Okay, chat with the turquoise and then we'll come to you. If we can get a mic over here into the middle, please. The Today programme today said that the street was sort of anti Wall Street city demonstrations in Greece had the real risk of derailing any European plans for that country. I've always assumed that the main reason why the welfare state will survive is because the capitalist system needs it. It actually needs to have a floor for the underclass not to disrupt capitalism making money. And that I think is its greatest chance of success. What does the panel think? Josie. <coughs> well, I do find that a slightly paradoxical statement because, of course, the welfare state was set up um, to replace that kind of system, which was, um, the, I mean, the poor law was meant to be for um, people who were not, not exactly <coughs> residual, but people who had sort of fallen out of the bottom of the economy. And the welfare state was meant to be universal and integrative and uh, sort of uh, applying to everyone. So I don't like the idea. I, I, I'm rather fond of the, the term welfare state, I must admit. And I would much prefer it to be kept for um, a universalist comprehensive system. It seems to me what you're saying is that um, the, um, the capitalist system will always need a poor law, and, um, which is a slightly different um, ambience. But does that make sense? It does make sense. Um, I would be very unhappy <coughs> if I thought that the poor law were to uh, revert to being the welfare state of the future. Question here, and then we'll go up the back, please, afterwards. Forgetting how we define the working class, there always has been one and always will be one. Um, the working class people used to be proud of being working class, often, in fact, seeing themselves as superior to other classes. Um, this clearly isn't the case today. Um, it's important, it seems to me, for social cohesion that the working class people should feel proud of being working class. Um, they don't have, there's always going to be somebody who isn't as clever or as able as other people, but that doesn't mean they shouldn't be proud of being human beings. How do we get the working class to be proud of themselves again? Such, such an important point. And um, I think part of what changed, I mean, you're absolutely right, by the way, because uh, that was borne out by a study, again, the Britain Think study I, I, I referred to earlier about class attitudes. And those who describe themselves as working class often came back and said that it feels like there's nothing to be proud of anymore. The heyday was given us the 60s, and many of them said, when asked to define being working class, they said it just meant being poor, which is obviously a dramatic shift. I think that had a lot to do with the 1980s. Again, I mean, I keep coming back to that, so funny that, isn't it? But the, the, uh, the consensus that was built after the 1980s was that being working class was something to escape from, that everyone should aspire to be middle class. That's something both New Labour and the Tories embraced. And I think there was an assault on key pillars of working class Britain under Thatcherism. Unions, over half of workers were members of unions in the late 70s. It gave a sense of collective identity, however flawed people may think that was on industries which, again, many back-breaking, dirty jobs, but often these were industries that sustained entire communities. I mean, mining communities were literally built around the mines, and people had pride in the work that they did, often. And again, council housing. Council housing was set up, when Nye Bevan set up council housing, um, in a mass form, that, uh, in the post-war form it took, he said he wanted to recreate the loveliest aspects of the English and Welsh village where the doctor and uh, the butcher lived next door to each other. And in, in the late 70s, actually, of the top 10%, 20% lived in social housing. It did reflect these mixed communities. But then, because of rights by and the failure to replace the last stop, it was, as Shiv says, it was effectively residualized. Governments treated it almost um, as a social dumping ground. That was their attitude. That's become their attitude to so social, uh, social housing. 
So my, my view is there was all these pillars uh, if, of, of working class communities came under attack at the same time. This consensus grew that you should escape from being working class and become middle class. That's the consensus that would have to be challenged. I'm not saying that's easy, but I think partly building a stronger collective institutions like trade unions, which after all, there's still 7 million trade unions in this country, that provides a collective voice for working people. I think that's the sort of thing we need to look at. Time for two more brief questions. One at the back there, and then I'll come to you afterwards. If you could get the mic to the please. Yeah, um, my question is directed to Mr. Jones. You said that um, you sort of referred almost to a meritocratic society, saying that sort of the top rung will be sort of skimmed off and moved up. And you, you almost made it out as if that was like a bad thing. Is that necessarily a bad thing? Because it shows people how if they work hard and try, they can achieve a better standard of living. Well, meritocracy incidentally was coined by Michael Young, and he coined it as a bad thing. And it's interesting how that word's now been embraced by virtually everybody, but he, came, he it was a satire he created in the late 50s about this dystopian society of a meritocracy. And his point was, you know, the people who are supposedly able rise to the top, what does that leave, where does that leave everyone else? There's huge problems with it. Uh, firstly, uh, inherited wealth, all of those other things, means that the odds are stacked in favour of lots of people. If you're middle class and born middle class, you'll almost always end up being middle class. It's used to justify inequalities, i.e. it just says that if you're at the top, you're there because you deserve to be there. But also, how do you define merit? I'll give you a very quick example. The New Economics Foundation did a study which showed for every pound that a hospital cleaner was paid, and bear in mind um, they're paid minimum wage generally, uh, 10 pounds of social value was created because obviously we, the healthcare system would be ravaged by these preventable diseases which would literally, well, not only kill lots of people, but put a huge burden on the NHS. They looked at then uh, bankers and advertising consultants, and for every pound they were paid, they thought they took about twelve pounds out of the economy. So, but they're obviously paid very well, and they're treated with, you know, they're still at the top of society. So again, it's about how do you define merit? I think it rubber stamps inequality, and also what does it say about everybody else? Can I answer that very briefly? <laughs> Actually, what do we what do we want out of that system? Uh, uh, which you know, those who champion meritocracy. <coughs> They often, this is what they often miss. What you really want is innovation. And you want people to actually, if they have ideas and, and good ideas, that they can try and put them into practice wherever they come from in society. Right? That's, that's one of the aspects. That's certainly one of the, I think, most important aspects. And that's the bit that we can't do now in, in the society thing. And, and the people with sort of, you know, volumes of ideas usually are young people. Um, and they often, uh, you know, try and fail at putting them into practice. But eventually they come up with winners. That helps everyone else. And that's the bit I think that we're missing in that in that debate. I'm, um, uh, and and actually, yeah, I mean, this ultimately the system at this moment doesn't really work in favour of that, which is the greatest tragedy. Uh, we have a capitalist system that just doesn't redistribute capital for bright ideas anymore. And the question, um, as as we don't have a large manufacturing industry anymore, and most of the jobs have moved out to China. Much of the work that we do in this country requires a higher set of skills, white collar work and above. How are we going to bring the working class up to be able to do those jobs, bearing in mind that education, the education that they need to get those better skilled jobs um, is now becoming unaffordable? Well, well just quickly, in terms of, I talked about this hourglass economy, it was these middle income skilled jobs which were taken out of the economy from the 1980s onwards. It's interesting what Germany have done to come back to Germany as a utopian society, I don't mean it like that, but they had an industrial policy uh, where you had an active intervention. Firstly, they caught the high-tech boom, and then they caught the renewable energy boom. And the position of governments in this country is that the government is not the government's place to choose winners and losers. You leave it to the market. But I think, for example, we could it's not about going to this smokestack industry. The mines aren't going to be reopened, and nor should anyone be calling for that to happen, even though it's disastrous what happened to those communities. It's about getting skilled jobs back to those communities. And I think so-called green-collar jobs, a Green New Deal where you build up renewable industry, you make it as a skilled niche, which is less easily exportable to other countries, and you focus that on those communities worst hit, which never recovered. I think that's one possible way for the future. Um, Ooh, yeah, not. again, here's another aspect, which is what do we mean by growth, right? Uh, and, and what we usually mean is sort of value added. Uh, and here's a bizarre way of looking at it. Lithium, 50 years ago, was worth nothing. Now it's worth a lot of money. And because someone worked out the sort of the innovation would be a long journey 
sort of innovating to the point where you got to say, well, yeah, actually, lithium is worth a lot. We need this. This is the kind of resource that we need. So that's, I mean, that's one aspect of growth. And that's, again, the bit that we haven't really been doing. That the thing that everybody should be aspiring to is middle class and upward occupations. And that somehow it's possible for, I think, it's, I think it, this isn't just true of Britain, no, it's probably more so than elsewhere in Western Europe, but that somehow Western Europe should be middle class and the working classes should be somewhere else, overseas. Uh, preferably, and, um, <laughs> um, uh, and I, I, I don't think anybody's really, nobody sort of planned this, it's kind of happened, um, and, and nobody really can face up to the, the, the kind of contradictions, to use a sort of old-fashioned Marxian kind of term, but the contradictions which this generates, because it's surely impossible to have a situation in which um, Absolutely, everybody is 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 um, a managerial or sort of middle management kind of person. Quite leaving aside the bankers for the, for the moment. So I, I I do think that somehow a, a, a really kind of peculiar problem for us as a historical generation is, is is latent in this. So I hope that makes sense. But I cannot see how quite to resolve it does make a lot of sense, as indeed has the whole debate. I think we could probably carry on all morning, but and so apologies for overrunning slightly, but uh, there have been plenty to say, and thank you very much for your input. Uh, Shiv Malik and Owen Jones will be in the Waterstones book tent signing uh, books if you'd like to go along and meet them and continue the discussion. Thanks again to the Orwell Prize for sponsoring. Thank you for, you for taking part, and thank you most of all to our panel. <laughs>